thank you, Elizabeth Shri, for uh, doing this presentation for us and joining us and talking to the students and teachers today. Great. Thank you, Kenny. Hi, everybody. I'm Elizabeth Shreve. I'm a children's book author. I sort of focus on topics in uh, science, and I'm just fixated with evolution and the history of life on Earth, and it's kind of my, my passion. So um, I'm so happy to be here today uh, and happy to answer questions when we get to it. Um, we're going to talk about Out of the Blue, which is a picture book that came out in 2021, got a couple of awards and, and done really well. And I have a curriculum that we'll look at later on. And because it's uh, National Fossil Day is tomorrow, we're gonna also get to look at a bunch of fossils today. Um, that's really where the understanding of life on earth uh, begins is with fossil discoveries. Uh, so, uh, we'll get to see some of those dating back long, long, long time ago through through Earth history. Uh, like a lot of uh, the viewers today and um, our readers, I was a great lover of books growing up. I love the ocean. I love to be outside. I did a lot of scuba diving and marine biology. And <clears throat> today I, I write these books that uh, still kind of feed on that curiosity that I had as a young reader, as a, as a kid. Um, and my latest book, The Upside Down Book of Sloss, just came out. Um, I love going to national parks and fossil sites and always with our, with our dog, Hector, who kind of follows us along. We call him Hector the Paleo Dog because he's been to so many fossil sites. When I write a book, of course, first thing you do is you dive into research and read a lot of books. This project, Out of the Blue, came to me from my agent, actually, from my literary agent, who said, um, got the idea from a friend and said, what about a book called Out of the Blue about how life began in the oceans and evolved onto land? And I said, well, that's the history of life on Earth. And she said, yeah, how about about, you know, a thousand words? So that's an enormous distillation of information. And I filled notebooks and charts and graphs with all kinds of information about the history of life on Earth, which I had studied in college. Um, and I read a lot, but still it was a lot. And I went back and I visited the museums at, at the um, Harvard Museum of Zoology, where I, where I worked as an undergraduate. I looked at animal fossils and also plant fossils that um, and I started to feel really overwhelmed uh, because there's just so much to learn and to know. So I turned to some experts. Um, I highly recommend if you're writing science, um, if you can, reach out to the scientists who are doing work in your topic area because this is their life and often they're just so generous and wonderful about sharing information. So I reached out to three experts in particular. Dr. Rich Moy at the California Academy of Sciences um, was so generous with his time. Uh, and he told me that when he was young, he longed to go out on a research vessel out on the ocean and learn all about ocean life. And he actually got to do that. And he became an expert in a group of animals called echinoderms that never left the ocean. They're things like sea urchins and sea stars. I reached out to Dr. Petra Searwald at the Field Museum because I wanted to know what was the very first animal that had crawled out of the ocean onto land. And she is an expert in uh, millipedes and centipedes, the, the myriapods. And she told me that when she was a young girl, her grandmother came to her and said, look at this spider, isn't it beautiful? <laughs> a lot of people are afraid of spiders, but she loved them. And she went on to become an expert in spiders and myriapods. And I thought that was just so great. And she talked with great enthusiasm about those little tiny creatures that are so important. Uh, to life on earth and are so resilient and have been part of life's biology for so long. Then I also wanted to know more about, well, 
What about four light, four limbed creatures? What were the first creatures, the bigger creatures, to come out of the ocean onto land? And for that, I I studied the work of Dr. Neil Shubin at the University of Chicago. And Neil told me that when he was a little boy, he really wanted to go and explore and find fossils that showed how animals had come on to land. And he studied and he worked and he got to do that. He got to go to amazing places, Antarctica, the Canadian Arctic, run field expeditions, <clears throat> and um, eventually discovered what's become, co-discovered, uh, what's become a really iconic transitional fossil called Tiktaalik uh, that was an example of uh, what he called a fishapod. <laughs> it's a cross between a fish and a tetrapod. Tetrapods are four-limbed creatures that, that uh, live on Earth. We are tetrapods, so we're horses. Um, so are snakes, actually. Um, and so here he is in the collections with a model of, of Tiktaalik, and that is a, a fantastic discovery. So all of these three scientists, you can learn a lot more about on my YouTube channel. Um, there's a video called Talking to the Scientists, and especially for the older, older kids, you know, um, it's a 17 minute video, but it has interviews with all three scientists. And um, we'll talk about some of the videos later. But if you're interested in hearing more from these amazing scientists, I highly recommend go listen to that video. So now I had an idea of how the or the information, the sort of body of information, I had it crammed into my head and into notes. But you can't just put all that information out on a page. You have to start someplace when you write a picture book uh, and you write anything, really. You need to start someplace. There's different ways to start a story, but the way... I chose to write this story was to start with a question. And that question is, which two of these animals are the closest relatives? So we have a shark, we have a hippo, and we have a dolphin. And of course, these two animals, the shark and the dolphin, kind of look alike, right? And they live in the water and they have the same shape. The hippo has a really different shape, and oh, this is a particularly adorable hippo, but um, as you might imagine, it's a little bit of a trick question. That question opens the book and closes the book, and that allowed me to start storyboarding, which is something that I like to do when I write a book, because I like to draw, even though I'm not an illustrator, um, but it enabled me to open the book with a question, and then I can set out the spreads and the pages in chronological order and end up answering that question. So that gave me a structure for the book. And then, of course, all I had to do was write it. And here's my desk where I'm sitting right now, um, which can get pretty messy. <laughs> um, I lay things out on the, on the table. I do a lot of drawings. This, these are actually early drawings from the illustrator for Out of the Blue, and uh, shows you how kind of some of those early sketches look. Here's the Cambrian spread. The Cambrian was an amazing period of, of Earth history about 540 million years ago, when all the basic life uh, groups of animals of our world actually took shape. But this is what I got from the publisher, from my editor, who took my words and laid them out with the artist's drawing. And then I spent a lot of time making comments. That went back to the illustrator. I got another version, uh, sent that back to my scientist advisors. And then here you see the finished spread. So that's kind of the process of what happens as you do these complicated picture books with lots of information. And this is one spread that was like particularly complicated. Um, and we had to work a lot back and forth getting the artwork and the words to work together.
And then finally, 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 after years of work, you get a box and it has a beautiful book inside it. And that's really exciting. So we'll go through the, a few pages of the book. Um, and I'm not going to read it because it's too long and because I hope you'll, you'll read it yourself. <laughs> so when you open the book, you see which two of these animals are the closest relatives. And that was that original um, idea that I had about let's, let's open um, with a question. Two have rubbery fins and ocean homes. They seem like close cousins, but they're not. How can that be? The answer starts with the smallest creature the world has ever known and ends with the biggest. So that was kind of a really cool book ending too that just sort of came to me when I wrote that, um, when I wrote that page. It's a story from out of the blue. And that's how the book opens. And then really go through a kind of chronology of some of the major events in earth history. This was an amazing education for me. Um, and one of my advisors, uh, Dr. John McCosker at California Academy of Sciences said, your book should be on all the college curriculum, <laughs> which I found to be a great, a great compliment because uh, most people really don't understand the history of life on earth. And I know that TIES does such great work um, bringing the level of exposure and understanding and appreciation for the amazing uh, length of time and the complexity and the fantastic um, adaptations through time um, that constitutes um, evolution with new species, extinctions, constantly changing. It's such an exciting, enormous topic. So to me, it's it's the greatest story. <laughs> um, I fought to have a timeline at, in the book and you'll see along the bottom, there's always a little bit of a timeline to kind of situate us in the, um, in the, in the period of earth history. Um, so back to fossils, um, I'll, I'll, I sprinkled in some fossils through, through these spreads. These are stromatolites, which are these structures that are some of the very first life forms. Um, and they are sedimentary structures, a tiny little um, bacteria that live in the ocean, gradually build, 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 build layers. And believe it or not, even though these are some of the very first fossils, the very earliest fossils, stromatolites still exist in some super alkaline, strange corners of the ocean where other animals and plants and, and organisms can't live, we still find stromatolites. I think this is in Australia. So that shows you the resilience of some uh, forms of life through what, billions of years of history. The Cambrian explosion where the major uh, groups, phylum of, of animals of our world basically took shape, including um, chordates up here. You see the, the first creatures with signs of spinal cords like ours that leads to the vertebrates that leads to us in case you're interested in kind of where you got started back 540 million years ago. Um, and it's a, it's a time of tremendous exciting excitement. The, um, the whole evolution of predator-prey relationships started to get going in the Cambrian uh, and the predators, the, the, the amazing animals that lived there are so fascinating. Arthropods, like those tiny little millipedes that crawled onto land that, that um, we talked about earlier. So um, this is an amazing, amazing time. Trilobites, here's some fossils of trilobites that date back to the Cambrian. And here um, in the later Cambrian and Ordovician um, is when the first little pioneers, the tiny millipedes, crawl onto land. Uh, and this was this fossil was discovered by a bus driver, a kind of amateur paleontologist, a bus driver in Scotland. So it just shows that amateurs have a lot to bring to uh, paleontology as well. This is a recreation of what one of those um, little critters might've looked like. And you can see the imprint 
that it left. It's a, a trace fossil and a body imprint. And then as time goes on, we're up to the Silurian period here around 440 million years ago, more little millipedes and centipedes invade the land and they're feeding on little plants that live right at the water's edge because the land is completely bare at this point. There's nothing, there's no forests, there's no soil. As we think of soil with organic material, there's nothing, it's just rock. All of this life is just coming from the ocean and pioneering its way onto the edge of the, of the land. But back in the ocean, there's gigantic creatures. There's these sea scorpions, Eurypterids, that were taller than people are today. They're just fantastic, huge predators, really amazing forms of life in the ocean. There's a fossil of a Eurypterid. Whew, we would not want to go swimming with a Eurypterid, that's for sure. <laughs> So what about fish? Well, in the late Devonian, we start to see maybe around 375, 400 million years ago, some fish start to crawl onto land. In the oceans, there's a lot of competition. Um, and so when there's competition, either animals die or species will die, or they'll find new ways to survive. So some fish, the what we call the lobe-finned fish, started to crawl onto land. And they began to gulp air rather than using their gills, like a like a uh, we think of fish doing. They started to gulp air and they started to inhabit that edge between water and land. Their descendants became what we call tetrapods. And here again, we see uh, Dr. Neil Shubin's um, tiktaalik fossil. Uh, it looks like a fish in some ways. It's got scales, but it's using these kind of leg apparatus to wiggle up onto land. And its eyes are going onto the top of its head. So it looks sort of like a cross between an amphibian, a great big amphibian. This, this creature is about maybe about four feet long and a fish, it's a fishapod. <laughs> and the descendants of those early tetrapods became the ancestors of all animals on land that have vertebrae like us. And we still have the same body plan. We have a big bone, one big bone, two little bones, lots of little bones in our hands and digits. That's the body plan of a fish and the body plan of all the tetrapods. So our bodies show the fish inside us. Their fins became our limbs. Our teeth came from their scales. Their swim bladders became our lungs and their gills became our jaws and ears. And also fish get the hiccups, which I thought was pretty cool. So Earth also go, uh, goes through periods of mass extinction. There was an enormous extinction event at the end of the Permian. Uh, that is called the Great Dying about 252 million years ago. But life came back and the land uh, now has more species, more species richness than the ocean. So the land has jungles and lots of trees and stuff growing. Um, there's, there's reptiles in the air, there's marine reptiles, and of course, there's these dinosaurs that you might have heard of dinosaurs. So this is the age of dinosaurs, the, the, the Triassic, the Jurassic, and Cretaceous periods, what we call the Mesozoic. Pretty amazing stuff. And there's also mammals during this time. And in the lower right, you can see that little, uh, that little critter, that's a mammal. Uh, but then uh-oh, here comes asteroid from outer space 66 million years ago, um, wipes out all the big animals. In a big extinction event, usually the larger animals are the ones that go extinct first. Uh, the big non-avian dinosaurs disappeared, the big flying reptiles, the pterosaurs disappeared, the big marine reptiles, the, the, um, the pliosaurs and mosasaurs disappeared. Um, and the, what we call the age of mammals began. Mammals are like us. 
we're mammals. Uh, we're warm-blooded. We give birth to live young, except unless you're a platypus, in which case you lay eggs. We have hair. Um, we, of course, we have vertebrae like a lot of, um, like all the tetrapods. And we feed our young with milk. Well, one branch of the mammal family split and one, one uh, branch of that family developed into large hoofed animals like goats and cows. The others split and split again and split again and went back to living in the water. All these splits, each animal group is adapting and finding ways to survive and in relationship to their environment. So that first group gave rise to the hippos. That second group gave rise to the dolphins. So there you go, that answers that first question. Here you see the evolution of the whales from kind of a uh, almost like um, dog or wolf-like animal in um, Pachycetus in, um, in the fossil been found in, in Pakistan. And you can see how gradually, gradually, gradually over time gave rise to the to the whales and the dolphins. Uh-oh, I'm gonna put my this in so that Hector the paleo dog doesn't disturb us too much. In whales and dolphins, you still see the vestige of a hip bone. Um, they don't have they don't have legs. They don't need a hip bone, but evolution is just messy. It just makes use of what what's available. So <clears throat> put this on in case Hector works. So we see in in whales today and dolphins today, we still see the vestige of hips, hip bones, like we have, even though they don't walk. So there you go. Evolution didn't get rid of that because there was no advantage to getting rid of those hip bones. And they're an artifact, they're a trace of what uh, origins were for, for those species. So there you have the story from beginning and end, floating, swimming, wiggling, or walking. Life moves between water and land, always changing, always evolving from out of the blue and back again. And with Fran Preston Gannon, I should say, uh, is the illustrator. And I just think her art is so beautiful. I never get tired of looking at it. I think it's it's so colorful and gorgeous and kid friendly um, that uh, it's a, really a pleasure. So teachers in uh, who are here today um, will be glad to know that the book ties in really well to uh, next generation science standards, especially for grade three, where biological evolution is a major topic, um, and that can be related then to. Uh, language arts and, and common core standards. I did a curriculum, a pretty thorough curriculum. It was the pandemic, so I was home <laughs> making curriculum and, and making videos. And, and a couple of teachers uh, helped me and tested this in their classrooms. And just recently, th this past week, I went to do an author visit for my new book, and the kids had read and done parts of this curriculum for Out of the Blue, and they knew so much about evolution and earth history. It was such a pleasure. They asked such great questions, which really made me realize that this little book, Out of the Blue, is a great way to kind of establish that baseline of understanding of the history of life on earth. Um, and I'm pleased to say it's coming out in paperback next June, June 2024, it's coming out. So this curriculum is all available free on my website. There's five parts. Um, for example, lesson three, the big move onto land um, has an activity of matching. Each of the activities kind of appeals to a different type of learner and relates to Common Core English language arts as well as next generation science standards. On my YouTube channel, you'll find the I call the quick tip videos, one five minute, four or five minute video for each of the five sections of the curriculum. Um, so that's a nice adjunct in the classroom. You can watch a little quick video. 
more information on um, evolution books. Um, ties, of course, it's kind of a little bit like bringing coals to Newcastle, <laughs> as they say, to um, be talking to ties about, about curriculum for evolution, because they're just great, great resources. Um, but a scientist at the Smithsonian, Dr. Brianna Pogner and I, um, decided to put together a list of books specifically about evolution, picture books and, and middle grade books, um, and as well as websites and, and teaching um, resources like TIES. And you'll find that on my website on the um, resources page, I think it's now called Visits and Resources. If you scroll down, you'll find this bibliography that's constantly updated. So it's a, just a Google spreadsheet. A few highlights. Um, I would say that some good primer basic books about evolution. Um, one reviewer said Out of the Blue makes a great transition between Grandmother Fish, which is a wonderful book for really young children, and then When the Whales Walked. Um, and so I would say Out of the Blue kind of fits that, that spot between those two in terms of the level of information. It's great for kids, sort of grades one to four. Um, new book on human evolution from the Magic School Bus. I love this new book, When Dinosaurs Conquered the Sky, um, from uh, Dr. Jim May O'Connor. Uh, it's just, a, it's a wonderful book. It's a fascinating topic. And then, of course, if you do like sloths, um, <laughs> this is my new book that came out just last month. And uh, it compares the modern sloths of, of our South American and, and Central American habitats to prehistoric sloths. So it addresses evolution and, and the kind of the contrast between giant ground sloths and tree sloths, including the, uh, don't forget that the giant ground sloths left behind uh, copper light fossilized poop, which are really enormous. And uh, kids get a little worried when I show this, like, oh, do you wash your hands? But this is 2 million year old copper light, so all the bacteria is gone. <laughs> but still, you know, it's a great fossil. Next year, um, I've got a similar book coming out about armadillos, the oddball book of armadillos, and then also from Norton Young Readers, a book on human evolution coming out probably in 2025. And with that, I think that's a pretty good little survey through Out of the Blue, and I would be more than happy to um, Take questions. I'm Kenny Coogan. I'm the CFI Education Coordinator. So the Center for Inquiry has three educational programs, one of which is TIES, and we're going to be talking about the other two in just a minute. TIES has been around since 2015. We've presented over 300 workshops in all 50 states. Our website is tieseducation.org. The idea for all three of our education programs is teachers helping teachers. All of our resources are free. Almost all of our resources are in Word and PowerPoint because we want you to edit our resources. We want you to put your name on it and we want you to modify it to meet your students' needs. We are on social media. We are on Twitter, we are on Facebook, and we are on YouTube. For YouTube, I've created playlists that are by theme or like thematic curriculum. So there's one on human evolution, there's one on natural selection, there's one on genes. So you can just go to those playlists when you're teaching those units in middle school and high school and kind of go through that. And all of our fantastic webinars are also listed on our YouTube page. To see uh, the upcoming webinars, you can definitely go to tieseducation.org or you can go to our Facebook event. And uh, this event, as well as at least one more coming up, uh, the publisher is the MIT Press, and they've been so gracious enough to donate some books for us to give away at our live webinars and in our in-person uh, teacher programs. So earlier, before the this webinar, we were talking about our book, which is called On Teaching Evolution. It was written by members of the TIES who have tackled the topic of evolution in their classrooms for decades. So if you add up all of the teachers, we have hundreds of years, maybe 200 years worth of teaching evolution in there. And it offers practical advice and sample lesson plans for fellow science teachers. And the cool thing about the book is that there's QR codes throughout the chapters that say what our favorite uh, 
bell ringers are, or icebreakers, our favorite lessons, our favorite labs. Don't feel the need that you have to purchase the book because all of our resources are free on our website. The foreword was written by Richard Dawkins. And just for you guys, we are having a BOGO sale. Buy one, get one free. So that means you can buy one and then you can gift the other copy to your favorite teacher or library. Another program that we have is Science Saves. Science Saves is a nonpartisan non -partisan effort to promote science appreciation by highlighting the many ways science has unleashed human potential, transformed our lives, and given us the tools to overcome all manners of challenges. So here we have K through 12 lessons in all disciplines about how science has really improved our lives. One of my favorite lessons is the one about child mortality. If you have to have your kids graph something, why not? Why not it be child mortality and us washing our hands or us using uh, vaccines? And then the last one is Generation Skeptics. This program aims to develop and foster an understanding of the world through inquiry-based learnings. We want to promote critical thinking, skeptical thinking. We have lessons that you can integrate in all of your curriculum. We have lessons on ghost hunting. We have lessons uh, on lots of different things. But one of my favorite aspects is that the if you are looking for a skeptic to zoom into your classroom, like on attachment theory or magic, or uh, supernatural things, we will connect you with an expert. And that would be a great, you know, it's October. Think of this for Halloween, but also year round. A couple of questions. I did announce the winners of your book in the chat. Um, M. Novotny, Karuna, and PHS Science Department are the three winners of today's webinar. So congratulations. Please send me your address in the uh, chat in the private chat below and I will send them out to you very soon. You have a couple of questions. One of them is from Lucy. What did you study in college? I studied geology in college. And in fact, my advisor uh, was a very famous evolutionary biologist named Stephen J. Gould. And um, he's probably one, just really one of the most famous um, evolutionary biologists of our you know, era. Um, but I was such, I just didn't know anything. Um, and uh, looks like somebody posted a question. Um, he, he was so inspiring. Uh, but he also encouraged me to take many different types of classes. So I took a lot of art and I took a lot of, you know, literature. Uh, I loved art. Um, so I really kind of did a, like a minor in art and a major in science. And then I ended up going into the field of landscape architecture and urban design. Um, and only about five years ago, kind of circled back to writing about science. Um, although I read, I've con I'm a student. I'm a student of science. That's how I like to think of it. Always learning. Nice. All right. We have a couple other questions. Bertha asks, at what age should kids start learning about this topic? And maybe as a side note, and by this topic, we mean evolution. As a side note, somebody else said that they use uh, grandmother fish with their pre-K students. Yeah. Well, there you go there. I think that's the answer. <laughs> I think it's a lovely, it's a lovely book. Um, it's not didactic. It doesn't clobber you over the head. Um, it just introduces the idea of evolution. Um, and that's what I really realized last week when I went to the school was how important the scaffolding is that they in introduce the idea of, of um, earth history start to think about the vast amount of time that's gone by. It's hard It's hard for us to understand that length of time. We are very caught up in the moment. But I would say, start to read, um, start to read those, those types of books, pre-K, you know, read about dinosaurs. Um, Kirk, Kirk Johnson, who's the um, head of the Smithsonian Museum of Natural History says, dinosaurs are the gateway to science like kids are interested in dinosaurs and um 
if they learn about dinosaurs, they'll start to put that into context and they'll, um, they'll get curious about what was here on this, on this earth before us, because we never overlapped with dinosaurs. They went, the big dinosaurs went extinct long ago, although we still have birds and those are, um, those are dinosaurs too. Has there been any book banning or is this book mm. doing okay so far? Uh, um, I haven't um, experienced any book banning. I actually was kind of surprised. I think my book banning, the book banning of this book or other books about evolution would be more that there's not, schools aren't going to teach it. They're just not going to have it. Um, the book banning seems to be more focused on other issues so far, you know, fingers crossed. Um, I, I, it's a terrible, it's book banning is, is really a, such an injustice to our children. Um, I have, we all have strong feelings about it, but so far I have not experienced, um, I haven't been notified that the book is banned and it is coming out in paperback next year, which I take as a really good sign. And I think that makes it available to more readers, uh, which makes me so happy. Lucy says, I am here with fourth graders. They want to know Yay! if the fossils <laughs> you find on eBay are real. They want to buy me a uh, coprolite. They want to buy you coprolite. I should have worn my, cop I have coprolite earrings that my husband got me for Christmas. <laughs> so it's, it's possible to buy <laughs> fossils and coprolites. Yes, it is possible. I'm sure there's some some sites that are better than others, but I don't know which ones. Um, but yeah, you can buy fossils. Um, and I have a lot of fossils around my house. We sort of collect fossils. And then there's places that you can buy fossils that can go into shops and stuff and buy fossils. Yeah. The PHS Science Department says, young children are sponges. One of our staff members, four-year-old, already knows about cyanobacteria. That's excellent. That's excellent. That's great. <laughs> and then M. Novotny says some library systems also have rock and mineral and fossil collections that you can check out. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. And then, of course, if you, you know, if you live near a museum, there's um, great exhibits. You know, a lot of places have wonderful exhibits on, on geology and, and evolution of life. If you don't, then there's also a lot of wonderful online resources. The Smithsonian, American Museum of Natural History, the field. Um, there's a lot of great online resources um, that you can share with your kids. And some of those are listed in that bibliography that I mentioned that's linked to my website. And that bibliography is also linked to the to the Human Origins site of the Smithsonian. And to All Ties. Right. I think Bertha put it on Ties, too. Yes, she did. <laughs> All right. Bertha is the TIES director. So for time, I think we have two more questions. One of them is from uh, M. Novotny. You know, a lot of elementary schools have uh, book fairs. Is it possible to get this book in a book fair or is it based on publisher? Do you know that? You know mm -hmm. how there's like scholastic book fairs, but I don't know if there's just like a general book fair. Um, I don't think there's a one that's more widespread than scholastic and i don't I, i've never heard that it's been picked up by scholastic but you can get it anywhere you can get it um wherever you know, books are sold wherever books are sold very good all right last question is from uh, bertha she wants to know what does she want to know <laughs> Okay. How do you answer the critics of evolution? So let's say you're at an event or have you experienced any of that? And that's kind of our last question that we do a lot for all of the webinars. Um, like last week, mm -hmm. we had some, a professor in Louisiana. So we just said, you know, is it more difficult? Do you have any pushback in the South at college level? So you're at the opposite end. Uh, yeah. Do you have any... Push yeah, back. I mean, I, I haven't gotten anybody stand, any adults stand up and, you know, confront me or anything, because I present mostly to children, and their teachers are there because they want me there. But I have had children who are coming from um, households where evolution is not a, a happy topic. 
And but they're they love the book because they children naturally love animals and they love strange, weird animals. Um, so I just say, you know, these are this, this is what the fossil record tells us, and this is what science tells us. And so, um, you know, this is this is the evidence that we have for how life evolved. I personally don't feel that evolution contradicts faith in a personal God. Um, I, I think that you, one does not negate the other. Uh, so I would never presume to tell someone that they're wrong. I think that evolution is the mechanism um, for life on earth and what makes that happen, you know, you know, that's for you to decide. All right. With that, we will thank Elizabeth Shreve once again for presenting her book, Out of the Blue, and also The Upside Down World of Sloths, and all your other books. <laughs> so uh, once again, can you say your website? Sure. My website is just elizabethshreve.com. Very easy to remember. And then you have lots of resources there, as well as tieseducation.org. Thank you, everyone, who attended this webinar live. And uh, we hope to see you again soon. Thank you, everyone. Bye for now. Mm -hmm.